The history of Indian civilization is usually narrated in terms of the rise and fall of various political empires. This cyclic process has continuously shaped the geographic boundaries of Indian civilization. Into this ferment were added new cultural streams coming from other civilizations. The Turkish invasion from Central Asia brought in the Islamic culture creating its own political empires in India. While India was struggling to contain and assimilate the Islamic culture in its political processes, the rising powers of European culture were finding their way into India. Eventually, European colonization led to the formation of the British Raj in India. With this colonization came scientific materialism and the Christian missionaries of European culture. This shook the very foundations of Indian civilization, setting in motion a new awakening. With this awakening came the rebirth of India as a modern nation-state. The post-independence era saw the accelerating process of globalization. And with the arrival of the internet, the cultural streams from around the world are entering and mixing with the Indian civilization. At the same time, the ideas of the ancient Indian civilization are spreading across the world. The celebration of the International Yoga Day is an Indian contribution to the emerging global civilization. But what is the essential vision and work of India among the global community of nations today? To know this, we must be cognizant of the vision and work of the Indian civilization that had been unfolding over many millennia. Behind the apparently random series of political empire building cycles, there is an emerging process of evolving consciousness. linking them together into a meaningful whole. The evolution of consciousness implies a collective conscious being within a civilization. This being is going through the process of its birth and growth through generations of people across the empires. A spiritual history must trace and reveal this process. The earliest memories of the Indian civilization can be traced to the Vedas of the Bronze Age. The Vedic mantras are not a product of reasoning intellect, but of intuition. According to Sri Aurobindo, in India, the reign of intuition came first before intellectual development. The Vedic mantras are still preserved in its ancient form as an unbroken living continuity. It is in the Vedic experience we can find 
the birth and childhood of the Indian civilization. The Vedic Rishis had already discovered the spiritual reality beyond the material facade. And they had also discovered the process of accelerating their spiritual evolution. This conscious and evolutionary transformation of their own being enabled them to access higher consciousness and its corresponding powers. They laid the seed ideas of the Indian civilization. The Vedic age was followed by a descending movement of consciousness which attempted to take up each lower degree of consciousness and link it to the spiritual summit. In this historic process, after the Vedas came the early Upanishads. The Upanishadic Rishis reaffirmed and restated the Vedic knowledge but in new forms. They laid the foundations of Vedanta. While their methods were still intuitive, their expressions had already become increasingly intellectual. This was the period when the Indian civilization reached its adulthood. This period was followed by the Age of Reason. With the Age of Reason came a great outburst of intellectual development flowering into six systems of philosophy and two great religions. They took spiritual truth as its basis and tried to reach it by the power of the mind's reflective, speculative, logical thought. At the same time, the processes of yoga were developed, which spiritualized the thinking mind. This period also saw the birth of two great epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata. Valmiki and Vyasa, the most influential poets of ancient India, took up the essence of the Vedic and Upanishadic experience and recast them into new forms suitable for the age of reason. The Gita of Mahabharata brought in a new synthesis of knowledge. The consciousness came down further, leading to increasing codification and systematization of knowledge of that era. As consciousness came down further, the emotional and aesthetic being was taken up as the means of spiritual realization. This gave birth to the Puranic period and Bhakti movements, spiritualizing the emotional being in the individual through the heart and its emotions. This period saw the birth of temples and deity worship. They revived and restated the ancient truths of the Vedas in terms of devotional poetry. Further descent of consciousness led to the development of Tantra, which took up the aspect of power and pleasure and turned them towards spiritualization. This period saw the proliferation of massive temple architecture and related tantric methods of occult sciences. There was a vast expansion of Indian culture across Asia. As the descending movement continued, the Hatha Yoga emerged which took up the body and its spiritualization.
This was India's entry into the physical consciousness and the plunge into its subconscious regions. And then began the withdrawal of the Indian civilization from its outgoing expansion of the previous tantric cycle. The civilization entered the dream state of sleep and its corresponding illusionism, which denied and neglected the existence of the material reality. It is during this stage of inertia of the inward absorption that the foreign invasions came to India. The powerful force of materialism that came from the West shook India out of slumber. The newly awakened India is recovering her true being. The recovery of the old spiritual knowledge and experience in all its splendor, depth and fullness is a first, most essential work. The flowing of this spirituality into new forms of philosophy, literature, art, science and critical knowledge is the second step. An original dealing with modern problems in the light of the Indian spirit and the endeavor to formulate a greater synthesis of a spiritualized society is the third and most difficult work. Indian civilization's success on these three lines will be the measure of India's contribution to the future of humanity. India has always existed for humanity and not for herself. And it is for humanity and not for herself that she must be great. In India, the most ancient records of spiritual self-discovery can be found in the Vedas. The Vedic seers boldly declared that behind the many forces of nature worshipped by man, there is one self, one being, one consciousness one existence. And we are one with that greater self, immortal and deathless behind the multiplicity of forms. This experiential realization was accessible to anyone who was willing to embark upon the path of self-discovery. And the seekers who had arrived at such a self-realization were called the Rishis. They guided the destiny of people, their kings, kingdoms, and the growth towards larger empires. They laid the foundations of Indian culture. But how old are the Vedas? The orthodox scholars position it around 1500 BCE. But the Vedic Rishis speak of themselves as new seers. 
and refer back to their own ancient seers who preceded them and found the path to self-realization. This makes it difficult to clearly demarcate the time period of the Vedic age and the antiquity of its systems of knowledge. The Vedic experience was orally transmitted across generations, encoded as mantras. Sri Aurobindo refers to this ancient mantric language as Deva Bhasha, in which the creative power of the word was central. The rishis were the discoverers of the Vedic mantras. They did not intellectually compose them. They discovered the flame of aspiration, the Agni, arising from their innermost depths and gave it utterance in life as mantras. The rhythmic words of immense transformative power an utterance that was one with the innate processes of nature. This Agni, this flame of aspiration, was not only within themselves, but they saw it everywhere in nature. Carrying forward a mysterious process of evolution in nature towards higher ranges of consciousness. Following the ascending path of Agni, they could discover and open to the descending power of Indra, of a divine mind above. And with it, the immense powers of self-transformation, a process that was at once a journey and a battle, ascending to higher planes of existence and receiving into themselves greater powers of consciousness. Beyond the material nature, they mapped the seven planes of consciousness. It is in the Vedas we find the earliest references to the supermind, the Mahas or the Vijnana, or in Sri Aurobindo's modern language, the truth consciousness. It was this plane of consciousness that linked the formless oneness above and the world of forms and multiplicity below. It was the dynamic foundation of oneness and multiplicity of creation held together in a vast harmony of truth consciousness. They mapped the ascending pathways to this sun world. It was their psycho-spiritual process of self-discovery and self-transformation. A process they referred to as Yajna, a universal process of evolutionary transformation in nature. At once subjective and objective. which brought not only spiritual wealth, but also material wealth and abundance. Their knowledge was encrypted in the living symbols of their mantric language, accessible only to those who were psychologically fit to handle the immense powers that it gave them. 
the mantras revealed their true meanings and powers only to those who could evolve to become the seers themselves. For the rest of the society, these mantras and yajnas remained as a means of gaining material prosperity. It was the age of intuition in India. The age of mysteries. The earliest dawn of spiritual awakening and evolutionary transformation of human nature. In course of time, already by 800 BCE, the original Vedic knowledge was largely lost. The outer forms of Yajna, which grew in complexity of symbols and rituals, veiled the deeper spiritual knowledge. We can see that Yaska, the ancient lexicographer who lived before Panini, counts more than 400 antique words of which he did not know the meaning. This loss of Vedic knowledge led to a powerful movement of revival in the form of the Brahmanas and the Upanishads. The Brahmanas focused on conservation of the forms of Vedic Yajna. They labored to fix and preserve every detail of the Vedic ceremony. The conditions of their material effectuality and purpose of their different parts and movements. On the other hand, the Upanishad sought the revelation of the soul of Veda. They sought to recover the lost or waning knowledge by meditation and spiritual experience. They were seekers of a higher than verbal truth. and used words merely as suggestions for the illumination towards which they were striving. The Vedic word was a seed of thought and vision by which they recovered old truths in new forms. What they found, they expressed in other terms more intelligible to the age in which they lived. Thus, the eternal knowledge enshrined in the Vedas was brought forth and restated as the knowledge of Brahman, the central idea of the Upanishads. Their real work was to found Vedanta rather than to interpret the Veda. The word Vedanta is nowadays often used as if it meant the end of Veda. But it means the culmination of the rediscovery of Vedic experience and giving them a new form in a more modern language based on the inner realizations of great rishis like Yajna Valkya and Janaka. While a large number of Upanishads emerged over many centuries, the ten most ancient Upanishads are considered as the primary source. These primary Upanishads themselves have always been known as the original Vedanta. They are at once the flowering and ending of the great age of intuition in India.
the Vedantic seers bridged the ancient mystic tradition of the Vedas with the coming age of reason in India. The immense work done in this period became the firm bedrock and perennial source of inspiration for Indian spirituality. It formed the young soul of Indian culture with a profound spiritual turn that would continuously unfold her mission for the next 2500 years. After the age of intuition and its profound heights of spiritual realization, consciousness was on a descending course of evolution. In this downward movement, a reasoning intelligence emerged around 500 BCE onwards. In India, as well in Greece and China, the faculty of reason, logic and philosophical methods were replacing the mystical and intuitive methods of the previous cycles. But in India, unlike other cultures, this effort was never dissociated from the spiritual motive of the previous cycles due to the great work done by the Upanishadic seers. It was a birth time and youth of the seeking intellect and, as in Greece, philosophy was the main instrument by which it labored to solve the problems of life and the world. Science too developed, but it came second, only as an auxiliary power. The ancient mantric language, which Sri Aurobindo referred to as Deva Bhasha, had already fragmented into many vernaculars. Grammarians like Panini tried to purify and reconstruct the ancient language. This purified and reconstructed form was called Sanskrit. Everything else became known as Prakrit. The algorithmic and generative grammar of Sanskrit provided a solid foundation for developing the linguistic precision required for philosophical inquiry. With it came the sutra literature, concise and precise logical expressions that were of scientific nature, unlike the Vedas and the Upanishads. The original intuitive and integral process and knowledge of the Upanishads fragmented into six major schools of philosophy and epistemology. The fundamental perception, separating, narrowed itself and became the Uttara Mimansa of Badrayana. The discriminative analysis, separating, narrowed itself and became Sankhya of Kapila, The psychological experimentation, separating, narrowed itself and became Yoga of Patanjali. The physical analysis, separating, narrowed itself and became 
Vaisheshika of Kannada. The analysis of discriminative processes separating narrowed itself and became Nyaya of Gautama. The application in formulas of life action separating narrowed itself extremely and became the Purva Mimansa of Jaimini. Each of the six systems arrogated to themselves the status of complete knowledge. Besides them, two major religions were born, Buddhism and Jainism. Systems of knowledge and world views differentiated themselves in terms of Vedic and non-Vedic. On a political level, this period saw the attempt of Alexander from Macedonia to invade India. In response to this new threat, with the statesmanship of Chanakya and Chandragupta, the Mauryan Empire rose up, encompassing most of India. The successive empires that followed protected India from invasions for another thousand years. Emperor Ashoka of Mauryan dynasty chose Buddhism to be his path and made it his mission to spread the cultural influence of Indian civilization across Southeast and Northwest Asia. Meanwhile, the notions of Dharma and Shastra dominated political and social discourse. Two national epics, Ramayana of Valmiki and Mahabharata of Vyasa, took birth covering the entire geographic area of India in its narrative. Both the epics based their stories on ancient legendary kings and their role in establishing dharma in the society. The Gita of Mahabharata brought in a whole new synthesis out of the fragmented systems of knowledge. The spiritual wisdom of the Vedas and Upanishads were given a new form accessible to the common man. These two epics were destined to shape the entire civilization for the coming two millennia. They deeply imprinted the ideal of spiritual purpose and self-realization in the social life of Indian people. It was a time of massive social construction, not only in terms of large empires, but also of philosophies, religions, epics, cosmology, astronomy, medicine, mathematics and social sciences with detailed systematization and codification. They laid solid intellectual foundations for a deep and rich spiritual culture. They powerfully directed the collective mind of Indian civilization towards her spiritual mission. This was the time when the soul of India reached her deep maturity and white creative capacity. After the divine childhood of the Vedic period, 
after the heroic youth of the Upanishadic seers who rediscovered the Vedic experience. After the bright and strong early manhood of the age of reason, the center of consciousness of the Indian civilization shifted further down to the heart. The power of rational intelligence, having matured through the previous centuries, stepped back and gave full play to the emotions and aesthetic sense. This shift found its matured and refined expressions during the Gupta Empire, bringing forth the golden age of the Indian civilization. It was one of the most opulent and creative periods in Indian history. As part of the ongoing development of reason, the Gupta period saw the birth and growth of Nalanda. the world's first residential university. During its peak, Nalanda housed 2,000 teachers and 10,000 students. They flocked to Nalanda from all over India and the neighboring Asian countries. However, admission to Nalanda was tough and only the intellectual elite could get through. The wider population, outside the universities and monasteries, were awaiting their spiritual education. As the center of consciousness had already shifted to the heart, the emotional and aesthetic needs of the civilization needed to come into focus. The already well-developed rational intelligence provided a firm foundation for all forms of arts, music and literature to flourish. The representative poet of the era was Kalidasa a Sanskrit dramatist and poet. His Sanskrit play Shakuntala can be considered as the most perfect and captivating romantic drama in all literature. It was time for the collective emotions of the Indian civilization to be refined and turned towards divine realization. This was accomplished through a new form of religious poetry known as Puranas and temple worship. The name Purana means from ancient times. During the development of the age of reason, the Gita had already brought forth the powerful role of love and devotion in spiritual realization. While Vyasa is said to be the initiator of the Puranas, it is during the Gupta period that Puranic poetry came to the forefront and developed. The seed of devotion sprouted and flourished in the form of 18 major Puranas over the coming centuries. They used the emotional being as the means of spiritual transformation and spiritualized the emotional level in humankind. Storytelling based on the Puranas, Ramayana and Mahabharata became the perfect means for the spiritual education of the wider population of all classes. This period saw a powerful revival of the Vedic culture. 
the Puranas retained the essential truths of the Vedas, but created new forms of expression. The Vedic pantheon of nature gods was replaced by the trinity of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva and their female consorts. The Vedic house of fire and sacrifice was replaced by temples and deity worship. This period saw the birth and growth of beautiful and ornate temple architecture in India. They appealed to the emotions of the heart and aesthetic delight expressed through sacred sculptures and designs. The deity worship rituals and ceremonies infused the spiritual ideals into the mass consciousness. The presence of the divine seated in the heart of humanity became a popular understanding. Devotion became a popular method for spiritual realization. It is during this period the story of the ten avatars of Vishnu came into prominence. The sequence of avatars provided an easy framework for the masses to comprehend the notion of spiritual evolution and the manifestation of the divine in humanity. Buddha was also integrated into the list of avatars. The ancient Vedic and Upanishadic cosmology found a new expression in the form of the seven worlds of Puranic cosmology. This set the foundation for the emergence and growth of Bhakti movement in India, orienting the whole civilization and its emotions towards spiritual realization. This evolutionary movement continued to flourish through many saints across India over the next millennia. The perfect outcome of this evolution can be found in the philosophy and religion of divine love promulgated by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Around 600 CE onwards, the center of consciousness shifted further downward. At the spiritual and religious front, this corresponded to emergence of Tantra, complementing the Puranas. Tantra brought focus on Shiva and Shakti as the cosmic creative couple. However, the seed idea was already there in the Vedas as Nri and Kuna. After the Vedic age, it became the Purusha and Prakriti of Sankhya philosophy during the age of reason. By 600 CE, these archetypal ideas evolved and got integrated into Shiva and Shakti of Tantra. The union of Shiva and Shakti as the central process of spiritual realization came to the forefront through Tantra. Once again, the ancient wisdom was recast into new forms suitable for the new evolutionary stage of the Indian civilization.
They took up the creative power of the life energy to turn it towards the divine realization. Tantra traced the cosmic creative process arising from Nada Bindu, the primal seed sound. They traced the geometry, rhythm and process of the Bija mantras, the seed sounds. It was also the time when Indian mathematics reached its glorious classical age. Tantrics explored and systematized the processes of creative energy or Shakti working through nature. They map and organized the knowledge of the chakras and naris of the subtle body. They develop a process of awakening the Kundalini, the divine force asleep in human nature, accelerating human evolution. They developed extensive mastery over the occult forces beyond physical nature. Besides spiritual liberation, they brought in the aspect of cosmic enjoyment as a natural progression in the spiritual evolution of humankind. They synthesized the spiritual relationship between man and woman, humans and nature. Even the sexual and sensual dimension of life was brought into the fold of spiritualization. By the 8th century, even the Bhakti movements had begun to turn the romantic and sensual energy towards the divine realization. Over the centuries, both Tantra and Purana mixed together and became the most living and enduring movements of the classical age of India. They had the most abiding result in the mind of the people. They opened the general mind of the people to a higher and deeper range of inner truth and experience and feeling. The centuries that followed saw the rise of massive temple architecture across India. By 1000 CE, India's cultural and spiritualizing influence was well established across Southeast Asia. Indian cosmology and systems of knowledge shaped large temples and cultures across Asia. It was the universal nature of India's religions, philosophy, science, art and technology that attracted the Asian neighbors. The Indian universities were sought after by the students from all the neighboring countries. India's extensive maritime trade became the vessels of cultural transmission. India's spiritual influence spread far and wide.
after spiritualizing the mind, the emotions and the dynamic energy, the center of consciousness of the Indian civilization shifted further down around 1100 CE. The root chakra or the muladhara corresponds to the physical consciousness according to Sri Aurobindo. In the long historic process, this shift brought forth the body consciousness and its spiritualization as the next stage in India's mission. It emerged naturally as a continuation of the ongoing development of Tantra and the knowledge of the chakras. The divinization of the body became the field of research and mastery for the yogins of India. To accomplish this, Hatha Yoga was developed and systematized based on the ancient wisdom. Yogic asanas and related processes were developed and practiced to master the body, its health and longevity for a spiritual life. For a Hatha Yogin, the body is not a mere mass of living matter, but a mystic bridge between the spiritual and the physical being. He does not view it with the eye of the anatomist or physiologist, but describes and explains it in terms of the subtle body behind the material frame. Hatha Yoga gave to the soul in the physical body the power, the light, the purity, the freedom and the ascending scales of spiritual experience. However, they were not able to discover the true characteristic method and power of spirit in the body that could transform and divinize the body. The methods of Hatha Yogins were physical, laborious and difficult and demanded most of their time and energy. They had to withdraw from society and the utilization of the powers gained for the welfare of the world became either impracticable or were extraordinarily restricted. On the other hand, the consciousness of the civilization was on its further downward movement into the subconscious ranges that were more dull, passive and steeped in inertia. At the same time, the philosophy of illusionism was gaining popularity in India. The world was increasingly seen as a dream, an illusion, Maya, to be discarded. The yogins withdrew from society in pursuit of individual solitary salvation. Indian civilization was steadily falling into a state of inertia and a dream state of sleep. Renunciation of the worldly life became the norm. The civilization withdrew from its outward expansion and turned into a state of inward absorption. This made possible the Islamic invasions from Central Asia to gain deep inroads into the Indian subcontinent. And India couldn't defend herself from looting and destruction of her temples and universities. By 1500 CE, most of India came under foreign rule. The Vijayanagara and Maratha empires were the last powerful creative outbursts of Indian civilization sourcing from her ancient stream.
However, they couldn't prevail against the invasions. The Indian culture became increasingly conservative. Meanwhile, materialism and modern science was rising up in Europe. The rising powers of Europe found their way to India. The British colonization of India was even more devastating than the Islamic invasions. The British not only looted India's material wealth, but also destroyed her economy and the ancient education system. By 1900, India was not only materially poor, but also culturally devastated. Instead of conquering and spiritualizing the body, the yogins looked at the body as a burden to be discarded in pursuit of the spirit. Spirituality became a withdrawal and rejection of material life. In the spiritual history of India, the first period was luminous with the discovery of the spirit by the Vedic Rishis. Their keyword was Yajna. This was followed by the Upanishadic Rishis, who rediscovered the Vedic experience but gave it a new form. Their key word was Brahman. The power of intuition was their means and they laid the spiritual foundation of Indian civilization. Upon this foundation was built the second period which laid the intellectual and philosophical foundations of Indian culture. It was an age of reason that spiritualized the mind of India. Their key word was dharma. Upon this foundation of dharma was the luxurious flowering of Indian civilization into elaborate details of an opulent living. This was the third period in which Puranas and Tantra flourished. If Bhakti was the keyword to the Puranas, Shakti was the keyword to Tantra. They spiritualized the emotions, the life will, and the life of sensations of the civilization. It was the age of devotion and the age of power in India. By this time, what began with a small group of rishis had spread to cover the whole civilization and the wider Asia. The last period saw the attempt to spiritualize the body with the power of Hatha However, this still awaits the discovery of the true characteristic method and power of spirit in the body. This period also saw the decline of Indian civilization under the impact of foreign invasions. The European colonization was a wake-up call upon India. Whatever temporary destruction this impact of European life and culture caused, on the positive side, it led to three needed impulses. 
it revived the dormant intellectual and critical impulse. It rehabilitated life and awakened the desire of new creation. It put the reviving Indian spirit face to face with novel conditions and ideals and the urgent necessity of understanding, assimilating and conquering them. India's rebirth began with social reformation movements with a spiritual orientation. Poets sourced their inspiration from ancient roots and promoted a new vision of Mother India. Artists gave birth to new forms of the ancient spirit. The ancient spiritual experience was recovered by three spiritual giants from Bengal. Sri Ramakrishna realized in himself all the spiritual wisdom of the ages. Swami Vivekananda's speech at Chicago was the most powerful message to the world that the giant Shakti of India was waking up. Sri Aurobindo awakened the will to freedom in India upon a spiritual foundation. He saw that the freedom and rebirth of India was only a step on the way and that there was a greater role for India in the world. The world was heading for an evolutionary crisis. The human mind had reached a stage in its evolution. It had to go beyond the power of rational intelligence to a greater consciousness. But the ancient wisdom of India was fragmented and scattered into many schools of yoga that were incompatible. Sri Aurobindo recovered the secrets of the Veda through his own spiritual experiences. He mapped the entire spiritual history of India, synthesized its various schools of yoga and gave birth to integral yoga a yoga for the evolutionary transformation of human nature. He discovered the key to the divinization of the body, which the Hatha Yogins and Tantrics had missed. His integral yoga was in its principle a taking up and summarizing and completing of the ancient historic process that had been unfolding in India. It is a yoga that brought together the spirit and matter, individual and collective evolution for a divine life on earth. Sri Aurobindo synthesized the Eastern and Western ideas of evolution and boldly declared that humans are transitional beings. They are not final. Evolution continues and humans will be surpassed. This is the future awaiting humanity. This is an unprecedented adventure of consciousness on earth. And India is destined to play a leading role in this adventure. We do not belong to the past dawns, but to the noons of the future.
Thank you.